And we are joined for the balance of the hour by Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs, who served uh, two tours in Afghanistan and one in Iraq. Uh, a lot of really interesting uh, stories you can tell to give you the perspective of a soldier and really likable guy like all the combat soldiers I've gotten to know. I don't think I've met any of them that weren't really nice down-to-earth uh, people who also weren't naive because of what they've seen in country. It's like a lot of my family are veterans of combat and special operations type things, and they're just like, of course the government ships in the drugs. Of course big banks launder money. Of course all this is going on because they saw it. Going back to Vietnam, you name it, it's only the naive public that really doesn't know what's going on. But he's going to tell us some of those stories about the DEA and some of the shady stuff he saw that really primed him to know what was happening. And maybe even tell the story about how he uh, you know, joined the Army. He told us yesterday for Obama deception, too, but it was all very interesting. I thought we'd get him to talk some about it today. And then, because he's already been on three times about this, talk about Hastings, because right on time when he got to town, it broke on the local uh, San Diego uh, TV stations and in some newspapers that Michael Hastings was investigating CIA Director John Brennan. Uh, and there's also uh, other intel he's got from his sources, uh, some of the other friends there uh, with Michael Hastings when he died. It's a big deal when an award-winning journalist who says he's going into hiding and on the run and less than 24 hours later his car blows up and then we're told, move along, it's no big deal, uh, nothing to see here. That is a that is a big deal. So we're going to talk about that uh, with Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs uh, at the bottom of the hour. Buddy, it's good to have you here and meet you in person. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. What do you think of the InfoWars operation? It's pretty neat. It's uh a lot bigger than I expected. It's pretty intense. It's uh, Everyone's pretty motivated and dedicated. I like it. They're an incredible crew. And not every TV radio studio has 50 cows. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely got to uh, hold on to two of those yesterday. That was pretty uh, pretty nice. Uh, next time you're down, we got to go out and uh, do some shooting. Oh, uh, definitely. I'll be done with Obama deception, and it'll be a little bit cooler. Not that you can't handle heat. Where was the hottest place you ever served? Um, Kuwait's definitely the hottest place. I didn't serve there, but you stopped through there. It is a, a toasty place. It goes from about 120 down to about 60 degrees at night. So that's a huge temperature change. It uh, it definitely shocks your system a bit. I bet. Uh, yesterday, I wasn't even really intending to get into this stuff with you for the film interview. Uh, but you started getting into how you started to really wake up. Tell folks some of the shady things. Uh, without getting anything, quote, classified, uh, that you witnessed. I mean, you perfectly described it, how they'd have you as a diversion over here. And then meanwhile, this would be going over here with the DEA and uh, how some of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, you were saying, was fake. But then some of it was real. That amazing story about the about the phone books in the walls with the list of who they were going to kill in the U.S. Uh, I mean, you've got the floor, Staff Sergeant Biggs. Break down your service, what you did, and, the, and some of the things you witnessed. Well, when I joined, I joined with the intentions that most people or most guys did when they went in, you know, serve your country, you know, no one, you know, I at that point never thought that there was anything wrong with America. I was just gung ho about it and I was pretty blinded by, you know, this whole perfect nation that I thought we had. And you repeat know, how you walked into the place and, and what you said. Well, I woke up this, this one morning. I was like, you know, I'm going to go do it. So I go into the, uh, to the recruiter office. I said, I want Iraq. I want combat and I want to go there as fast as possible. What can you do? And the recruiter looked at me and he goes, well, you just made my job a lot easier. I said, I just want to do this. I need to get it done. It's something I have to do. And next thing you know, I was a basic training and then off to Iraq just a few months later. So, yeah. that was. Well, let's get into the shadiness. Then we'll get into some of the IED stories and stuff. But uh, tell yeah. folks some of the first shady things you saw. Well, definitely uh, one of the missions, well, there are real terrorists out there. A lot of people think that, you know, that's kind of a, a fake thing and they're not really out there. It's just us making that up. I went on a mission personally, and uh, from what we were told, it was just an IED-making facility, which is an improvised explosive device. And what what we found out when we got there was it was a lot more than that. Uh, we were, I would go through with the metal uh, scanners, and we weren't finding anything on the floor, so we started going up on the walls and started getting some, some reads. So we started busting in through the walls, started finding shrapnel, passports, Money, explosives, phone books, a New York City phone book with, you know, names circled in it, all kinds of stuff. I mean, these guys had the money and the... And you the said means. it was public figures and government people. Yeah, I mean, they had the means to, to do something, and luckily we were able to find that and stop those people from that. But, but specifically, the type of shrapnel, tell them what was in the phone books. In the phone books, it 
people you would hear on the news a lot. I mean, names like that, stuff like government officials, people like that that were circled in there. The stuff, the, the types of materials they had were glass, like marbles. So if something did hit you, the shrapnel would go into your body. And if they scanned you, they couldn't find anything. So, you know, it was just a silent killer right there. Yeah, because it's even hard, I guess, to get the metal out. Yeah. You, you, you've been a victim of that. Yeah. Um, another one, we, uh, you, we would get times where the DEA would come and stay with us and be embedded with us and go out on missions. And they would just be kind of, you know, we weren't allowed to talk to them until it was time to. When they did speak up, we would sometimes be asked to go down to opium fields and try to, you know, cut them down. Other times we were told to guard them. You know, and, you know, they would have us cutting down fields and then they would have us guarding ones. And that was just, I always thought that was kind of weird. That's what I've been told by f family that was in uh, Columbia just a few years ago that they have GPS grids where they spray the, the, the people that don't launder their money with the right banks. And of course, they had public meetings in Columbia back in 99 where they sent the Grasso, the head of the stock exchange, went down and met with the head of the FARC and said, you invest with us or we kill all your fields and invade. And then they didn't, so they kill their fields and then grow it and ship it in. Yeah, there was always, you know, like I was saying, like you, there, there was this going on, what we thought we were doing, which is winning the hearts and minds. And then, you know, we had these, you know, operators that were doing something else on the backside. So we were this cover mission, and then these guys were kind of off in the back doing other things as well. Was it mainly DEA? I mean, what would happen after you'd guarded? Because from what they've admitted, they would then process it, then ship it out, and it was flown out. Well, a lot of times we would capture the people there that ran that, and then they would take them back and interrogate them. Maybe shake them down. I mean, who knows? We weren't really allowed to get close enough to hear what they were saying, but all you could hear was screaming. You could definitely hear that. So torture? Yeah. It's something After hearing that, it's something I never wanted to be a part of, I tell you that. How were they torturing them? Waterboarding or pulling fingernails out? I mean, like I said, I was outside the building. All I could hear was just that, you know, so that alone, just the screams from a person. I was told DEA uses electricity and little crank deals. It's, anything was possible at that point. I mean, I the, the yells that I heard, I've heard people get shot and I've never heard that yell before. I've heard people, you know, scream from being stabbed and... The, the, the yells I heard from a person, those were just ungodly. And they were wanting to know, I guess, where the, where the stashes were buried, too. That, that's worth a lot of money going in our daughter's arms here in, yeah. here in the U.S. Yeah, I got to ship that in immediately. Um, how often would they torture people? Um, it wasn't, like, real often, maybe every few months. It just, whatever kind of intel they would get, they would use us for covers to go run missions. And they would be like, oh, you know, we need to go over here. And we just have to let them go do their thing. By the way, that's breaking news. So you would see DEA take farmers in and then torture them. Well, I mean, they would, wouldn't would call them farmers. You know, they would be like, these are Taliban people. And, you know, and these guys would come in and they were all bearded up guys, you know, wearing all black, you know, special tactical gear and all that stuff. And they would take them in there and interrogate them and do whatever. Were they CIA? Were they Navy SEALs? We were told DEA and then the other term they used was OGA, other government you know, or, yeah, other government agencies. So. Sure, to be clear, but I can show clips of Fox, CNN going, here's the Marine Corps commander, he helps grow the opium. Yes, these are just farmers. So so they would call one group farmers, and the other group they would call terrorists. It's, yeah. My point is, is that uh, how long would the torturing go on for? About an hour or so. And then they would tell us to take, you know, control over that uh, person of interest, and then we would have to go take them to a main, or, like, to a main base, and then convoy them out there, turn them over to be detained, and then eventually they would get let go the next morning. Oh, so that we, it, it wasn't the long, I'm sure you read about, you, know, you may have seen those special torture camps they had that are basically like hell houses, you hear yeah. about those? Mm -hmm. um, did, you ever, did you ever see them bring kids into the hell houses? No. No. Because the Army report says they did. Oh, it's possible. I mean, there was, there was definitely a group of kids I would have liked to have seen going in there one time because... Uh, Three kids marched a suicide bomber up to our gate, and the guy went off and almost killed a quite a good bit of it. Really? Yeah, and those kids just took off. They act like, because we saw him sitting there walking with this guy up to the gate, and these kids were kids we'd seen the whole time we were there. So they seemed friendly kids. And they walk up with this guy holding his hands, and they're all just like, oh, you know, we've known this guy forever. And next thing you know, the kids run off, the guy throws a grenade and pulls a pulls string and pff, blows up. And all I could see was his scalp just floating down. Wow. Uh, you know, the, the social engineers love war because it corrupts everybody. Yeah. It's definitely a, uh, 
not meant for everybody. It's a hard job to to go over there and, you know, like I said, you go over with these pure intentions, but at, at the end of the day, truly all you want to do is get home and you just care about your buddies getting home. And it, it kind of, you you know, you're not all this, you know, God bless America, this and that, you know, right now it's at this point where there's so many bad things going on that you see, you're just kind of sick of it. And all you can do is just look at your buddy and be like, man, I just hope you make it out of this. You know, that that is cultural mind control, though. Uh, you don't even have to put them in a CIA mind control base to make them blow themselves up. To to, to blow yourself up uh, to try to you know kill people. It's just it shows a high level of control. The media always calls them cowards, but for me that I don't think that's cowardly. I, I don't like what they're doing, but I don't think it's cowardly. No, it's not cowardly. I mean, it definitely takes some cojones to be able to strap a bomb to yourself and you know be able to say that goodbye. You know, you're not going to see your family again, and to have this mindset that you're going to go to this better place and. You know, you're really doing this for this pure reason. You know, I don't think. Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs, this is Powerful Radio. Stay there. I want to come back with more of your combat stories and the breaking news on Michael Hastings and the IED that I believe clearly took out his car in California a few months ago. I'm Alex Jones. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the Infowars Nightly News. And over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones radio show live as it happened. So check it out, Infowars.com forward slash show. Folks, Alex Jones here, back live. Sergeant Joe Biggs is here to get into what happened to his friend who was embedded with him for several years, off and on, in Afghanistan. Uh, Sergeant Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs uh, is here with us. Briefly in this short six-minute segment, just because people need to get the perspective, I read about some people that have served five, six, seven, eight tours. You served three and saw a lot of incredible action. Uh, what is the max you've heard of somebody serving combat tours? Upwards of almost two years. I mean, yeah, that's I mean that's a long time to be in the in the crap in the in the gutter with the blood and it's. I mean, a year. The army has the longest deployments there is. I mean, the Marine Corps goes for a short amount of time. No, but I mean, how many how many tours total? Oh, I've heard of upwards of. I mean, in the army, like I said, they're year long deployments. So, if how many year long deployments? Eight. Yeah, that's that's the max I've heard of. And that's that's just mind blowing. But I mean, that's over probably a span of you know quite some time. I was talking to an Air Force officer who's who's a pretty high level officer over military police, and he said, "Look, all the services fight now when you're over in Afghanistan or Iraq." He said, "The convoys, all the rest of it." And he said, uh, "He's basically the entire Iraq war been at one time or another in it, and all his buddies have been killed and stuff." It was just amazing to think about. I guess that convoy duty you've done is one of the worst things. Oh, yeah, it was horrible. I mean, because the easiest way for the insurgents in Iraq to stop, you know, the military from conducting missions was to cut off a fuel supply. So what we did was four or five Humvees, have a Humvee up front, three or four fuel tanker, a Humvee, three or four fuel tankers, so forth, so on. The whole convoy would spread about a mile, mile and a half long, sometimes two miles, just depending on how we kept our intervals. And they would just be setting up bombs, small small arms attacks, just like AK-47 fire, which would be nothing. We just kind of laugh and drive through it. But a lot of times, they'd hit that first vehicle, which was me. Then it would stop the convoy, RPG attack, gunfire, and all that. So it was, uh, every day was one of those kind of like puckered up deals where you're like, you know, every inch of road you go across because it's going to be the last thing you ever see. Tell that IED story. <clears throat> yeah, I was uh, in Samara, Iraq. We were just leaving uh, Tikrit, and we were going south to Balad. And uh, we were approaching the uh, Samara Bypass. And uh, right as we were coming over that, the hill, the sun's coming up. And you know how when you're at the airport and you see that haze over the runway, that weird look, you can see that the fuel coming up out of the, the pavement. And I remember seeing that. And I'm kind of, it was just hazy. Heat devils. Yeah. And I was like, that looks like a boom. And then the vehicle just launched up in the air. You know, when you see explosions on movies, you see people in crashes, they slow it down. And I always thought as a kid that that's just what they did for some kind of effect. You know, that really happens. I remember just being there and like seeing a piece of paper float by my face 
and kind of looking over and seeing my buddy, Sergeant Williams, sitting there and his head smashing against the wall. And then everything just kind of speeds up. And I guess your mind's trying to, you know, process what's going on. You know, the vehicle hit the ground. All the tires were blown off. And the third Humvee saw my tires, which was the convoy commander. And after, like what I just said earlier, a Humvee, three, you know, fuel tankers, a Humvee, that's a good distance back. So, I mean, this, that explosion had some pack to it. And I was in a ASV, so it has a V bottom. So when it hit the ground, it did this and wobbled and then went over and then flipped. And uh, fuel started coming out, fire. And next thing I know, actually the guy that I met last night, he was one of the guys that helped uh, pull me out. All I could hear was uh, banging on the uh, armor. And eventually they pried open one of the doors and started pulling us out. Uh, the inside of my esophagus was burnt from breathing in those, ex you know, the explosives and all that, the fumes. Uh, I just had a uh, endoscopy done, and the inside of it just looks like someone took claws and ripped it through. You were saying that's why you can't have white sheets. You yeah. bleed everywhere. Yeah, I'll still cough up blood. The back of my head still bleeds, and this was September 26, 2006. So, I mean, for that stuff. Is that what got your foot with the shrapnel? No, that was in Afghanistan. This was Iraq. What happened to your foot? Oh, just caught some stuff in a firefight in my right foot. It's one of those things. I guess I make it sound like it's nothing, but I mean... But I was, I, I've been seeing these news articles now where some of the guys will have like half their foot blown off. They're putting... They got guys with prosthesis out there now, right? Fighting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean... Uh, I never... I mean, not a lot of... that. That's like old-fashioned where guys got like peg legs out there fighting. I mean, there's some motivated men out there. I mean, they, they don't want to give up. I mean, it's one of those things. It's your life and it's... That's what you want to do. You've done it for so long, too. It's kind of hard to... Once you've been in, like me, I was in for a long time. Once you're in that long, it's it's hard to imagine not being there anymore. Is it also a drug? <laughs> it feels like it, yeah. It's definitely a, a rush that nothing else in this world will ever give you. Absolutely. You start talking about fighting, I see the hair standing up in the back of your yeah. neck. I can see it from here, huh? Yeah. We'll be right back with Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs. Long segment coming up. We're going to shift gears into his friend he was embedded with in Afghanistan, Michael Hastings. This is important information. Stay with us. I'm Darren McBreen, and these are some of the new items that are available now at InfoWarsShop.com. Alert the public to Obama's blatant abuse of power with the new Obama t-shirt. Obama's joker face on the front and come and take it on the back. It's time to publicly call him out for what he is, a tyrant. Defend the Second Amendment with our top seller come and take it t-shirts. And look at that, women's cut tank tops and t-shirts now available. Nice hat. Plus, the Don't Tread on Me flag. And now you can become a micro distributor of the InfoWars magazine. Plus, get your own copy delivered right to your door each and every month. And if you're tired like I am of you and your family being exposed to polluted drinking water, get the Pro One High Performance Water Filter. It gets rid of all pathogenic bacteria, cysts, fluoride, heavy metals, and numerous other contaminants. So join the revolution at InfoWarsShop.com. All right, Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs is here with us, and he's told some of this already, but since he's here with us in studio, for radio listeners and also TV viewers watching on PrisonPlanet.tv, I thought that we should walk through all of this uh, again, uh, what led up to Michael's car blowing up, the Rolling Stone associate editor. And the reason I made a big deal out of this is, in the past, the media would go look and see if this was foul play. Uh, just out of hand. Instead, day one, they said, you don't say it can be foul play, that's a conspiracy theory. And then just more and more comes out. The car not speeding as fast as they said, the flash of light. Uh, then, it, clearly, it, people going looking at the tree, including our reporters, we sent to LA, the tree not even really damaged, it came to rest up against it. The engine uh, blown out the back way down the road, uh, all of this stuff. Uh, and, and the fact that he sent an email saying basically, they're after me, I, I'm gonna go into hiding, get ready for the feds. And some of uh, Michael Hastings' other friends that have talked to Joe Biggs, and of course, uh, Joe got the email uh, where he said he was basically going into hiding and had a big story he was about to break and get ready for the feds to come. Everybody else was too scared to even release that email. And let me tell you, folks, when it's not an inside job or foul play, 
They come out and say we're doing an investigation for a couple of weeks and the car blew up. We don't know what did it. When it's suspicious, they go, no foul play. This is completely normal. Happens all the time. Nobody look at this. Uh, the feds weren't talking to him. He wasn't working on a big story. There's nothing happening here. Just, just move along. When you see that type of behavior, ladies and gentlemen, that's when the red flags go up. And I've seen them kill a lot of journalists. Gary Webb, you name it. The Arkansiding of people. Uh, this is a really serious issue. And persecution of press all over the world is a big deal. So Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs, uh, good friends with Michael Hastings. They kept in contact with each other in the years after uh, they'd been in combat together. Um, said, I'm going to stand up for my friend. He went to the memorial on the East Coast, uh, was there. Uh, she came up to him. I mean, he really told the story in detail yesterday and specifically told him, I'm going to bring down whoever did this. And then to see her up there all glowing, oh, nothing happened, move along. I mean, folks, this is really getting getting serious and uh, if, if they can kill Michael Hastings and nobody investigates it, then they can kill Alex Jones. They can kill Ron Paul. They can kill Matt Drudge. They can kill uh, Breitbart. Oh, I guess he's dead. They can kill whoever they want. And at a certain point, if more people start dying, I don't know what we're supposed to do because, you know, I'm not looking to start a fight here. But and I know it's a big shadowy government and things, but, uh, you know, at a certain point, we just can't sit here while death squads run around killing whoever they want. Uh, now, uh, Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs, you heard me just lay out some of the basics of what happened, but getting back into it, talking about remembering Michael Hastings and, and just repeating what you said about him in combat compared to all the other press you ever saw, and then how scared he was. In your own words, repeat what you said yet last night to the cameras, on record here live on air for our own safety, because I want to get everything out you said last night here live on air, because I don't want to sit on this tape while we're putting it in the film, and then, you know, we both end up uh, having our own little explosions. Well, like I've said before, 2008, uh, I find out that uh, we're going to get another reporter in bed with us. And, you know, like me and the rest of the guys are kind of like rolling our eyes like, oh, great, here we go again. Another, another, you know, reporter coming out here saying that they're going to be uh, all hard and hard charging and they're, you know, dedicated to working on their stories and doing all this. And to, you know, when he gets there, it was just a whole different persona of what I just had, you know, in my head from all the other guys, he jumps in there and he's just like, you know, what are you guys doing? What are you working on? You know, how could I help? You know, what's the best way to, you know, portray what's going on? You know, so we get out there and we finally get on, he gets, he goes on a few missions with us and he actually was involved in a pretty big one up on a uh, mountaintop in Pakistan. And we came under attack and, you know, like I'd said before with other reporters, they would just whimper down and they would, you know, you know, like, why did I do this? I want to go back home. I didn't sign up for this. You know, and Michael's just sitting there with this grin on his face, and I'm looking over at him. And I just remember kind of sitting there shooting my M4, and I'm looking over, and he's just looking up at me smiling with the camera. And he's like, is this it? Is there more? You know, he just had that intensity, that passion about what he did. And you described there's A-10s, helicopters, mortars going off around you. Oh, yeah, there were A-10 Warhawks coming in. We had helicopters shooting Hellfire missiles. It was, it was just complete and total chaos. Controlled chaos, I guess you could call it. was like it. a scene out of Apocalypse Now. Yeah. It's one of those things that you kind of, you want to see when you get in the military, but then it happens and you're like, wow, this is not like the movies. This is so intense. Like, there's so many parts moving, you know. You know, the guys on the ground calling in for the airstrikes, the artillery, the, you know, all this stuff, trying to get clearance from Washington. Can we use a C-130 Spectre gunship? You know, can we do this? And they're like, no, you know, it's not important enough, okay? Well, there's like 300 of them and 30 of us. I think that's pretty important. But <laughs> the A-10s took care of it for us. But, you know, Michael was just that guy. He he didn't shriek back from the fear. He loved it. I mean, he was just a go-getter and an adrenaline junkie and definitely right up my alley, my kind of guy. Um, I think there was more to this guy than meets the eye. I mean, he marries the head spokesperson, the PR flack, the PSYOPs officer of the National Security Council. That's the top of the pyramid. Worldwide, uh, because you've got globalist interest and, and, and banksters that own things, but the, the, the United States National Security Council is telling NATO what to do. It's telling the UN what to do. It's making all the decisions. I mean, that's the top of the pyramid. The Ayasoron, that's right in the middle of it. He marries her two years ago. Yeah. Love, I guess. <laughs> uh, Love will do crazy things to you. And definitely, uh, it's definitely not one of those, uh, you know, 
a matchup you would think, but, you know, whatever. Amazing. Uh, I mean, repeat what you said yesterday about uh, leading up to this, talking to her, and then when you're in that restaurant, your buddy goes, look up, she's on CNN. And I mean, just your whole take on that. Yeah, you know, from the get-go of how he was in Afghanistan, courageous, you know, brave, strong kind of guy, you know, all he did was speak the truth and he didn't let anybody hinder, you know, that he didn't let anybody kind of like persuade him to change his stories, his words. He spoke the truth and that's just how he was. So I get the, you know, I get this email and that email, you know, he sounds so scared and it just didn't sound like the Michael that, you know, myself or anyone else knew. When you said you talked to his other friends who physically talked to him. He was looking, I'm mean, going to repeat all that. The feds had come to the house, looking under the car. He, you said he was scared. Yeah, he had... Uh, LAPD and then some other people had come by the house, could have been feds. Like, like I said, at that point, there was a lot of weird things happening in the days leading up. He, you know, he was seen looking under his car with his brother. Um, his other buddy, a mutual friend of Mike and I's, uh, said that five days out, he started speaking in code. He was just panicked and on alert, you know, just seemed like he was constantly looking over his shoulders left and right. And I knew he was... Like that in a sense, because what happened with the McChrystal story, you know, he'd called me a few times and I'd spoke to him and he's like, you know, I'm kind of scared. Well, you told me people were telling him we're going to kill you. Yeah. I mean, he even wrote that in one of his books. I mean, he, he pretty much came out and said that they said that. So, I mean, he definitely. So the biggest killers in the world say we're going to kill you. Your car blows up and it's not suspicious. I mean, everyone just wants to crack up to be some accident. I guess it's easier to sweep this away and sweep it under the rug than to actually dig in there and ask the questions and. A lot of people out there just don't want to get into it. But, you know, it's not going to stop me and some other people I know that are still curious and still have all these unanswered questions and we want to find out what's going on. Well, like you said, Mike would do it for you. Oh, of course. Mike would do it for anybody. I mean, that was just the kind of guy he did. Anything, any kind of, you know, unjust act that happened and he didn't feel right about it, he'd get that gut feeling. I mean, he's going to look into it. I mean, he was going to find out what's going to happen. I can't just not, you know, I didn't choose for the email to come to me. I... You know, I would have saw that and been like, you know, what's going on and definitely still been curious about the whole thing. But it came to me and I would I didn't ask for it to happen, but I got this feeling I, I had to do something. But before I even released the email, I started contacting the other people that were on there and I'm asking them, hey, don't you think this is weird that we got this email and now he's dead? Like, are you guys at BuzzFeed going to do anything about this? And then the response I got was, you know about this? Question mark, question mark. And then that was it. And I kept emailing them back. So what are we going to do? Nothing. So I started asking around, you know, I asked my mom for some advice. I was like, you know, should I, should I say something? And, and my mom was like, ah, don't say anything. She's like, that's some scary stuff. I thought about it for a while and I was just kind of like, you know, my gut tells me I've got to say something. So I started contacting different people and you know, KTLA was the one who responded. So I forwarded him that email. And now, you know, most people aren't thinking this is an accident anymore. They're kind of getting that feeling that I had from the get-go. That's right. You brought the the fact that he was going into hiding, that the feds were coming after him. They didn't want that in the equation. They wanted everybody to be scared. Yeah. But one guy stood up, and now more and more is coming out. Get into, I mean, repeat what you said uh, yesterday when we were taping in there for the film about you know what she told you at the funeral then versus what you saw on CNN and what you think might be going on there. Yeah, I, I went up to Vermont with a, uh, a mutual friend of Mike and I's and uh, stayed with them and uh, we went to the uh, memorial service and we get there and I kind of do a walk through, you know, shake his father's hand, his mother, his brothers and sit down and it's just kind of one of those sad you know it was just it, it was it was nice to see that many people who cared about him show up but it was just kind of a sad just overall crazy. solemn yeah so i walked i was like hey, you know i gotta get out of here for a second and get get a water so i'm walking out and as i walked around elise came around michael's wife and said staff sergeant biggs and i turned around and she goes come here you know i'm sitting here thinking all right this could go one of two ways this could be like uh, uh, thanks for you know bringing this to light or you know this isn't into your business why did you release this I mean, really, it could have gone either way. Well, he sent you the email. Yeah. So she actually comes up to me, and she's crying, and she hugs me and says, thank you. She starts talking 
to me about how Mike had spoken about me many times. And I mean, she knew more about me than I knew about her. I mean, she was just going from story to story from Afghanistan and the conversations we would have. And she knew everything about me, you know, and I kind of put me more to calm. And then, you know, after she wiped the tears away, you know, she got that, that pit bull look. And she, she told me, you know, we're going to find out. She's like, I'm going to find out who did this. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to like roll over on this. This isn't an accident. I will find out who did this. And that was pretty powerful for me. She I, said this wasn't an accident. Yeah. And, and then fast forward a month later. You... Yeah, well, then I tell her that I'm going to go to L.A. and do some investigating. I want to look around and find out what's going on. You know, I had a, a whole checklist of things I wanted to, you know, cover and go over. And we have some potential suspects. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think she was threatened, but keep going. So I send her that, and at first she's like, okay, that's fine. You know, she just seemed all, you know, dandy about it. It seemed like, yeah, whatever, you know, go do it. You know, that's your friend. You can find out whatever you want. You know, I'm going to do what I'm doing and investigate on my side, and you do what you want to do. And then the next day, I just, I wake up, and I'm, I, like, I took a nap, and I had like four or five long texts. That was right after you'd been on my show. Yeah, four or five long texts, and, you know, like, don't go to L.A., don't do it, don't do it, please don't go. And I text her back, I was like, why? And she's like, just don't do it. it I don't, you know, I don't want to get into it, just don't do it. And then I called because I was like, you know, my heart started pounding. I'm like, all right, why the big change? And uh, when I called, she didn't even answer. Someone else did, this lady, saying that it was her friend, you know, and I could kind of hear her off in the background. And they were just like, you know, Elise doesn't want you to go right now. Please don't do it. Cancel the, the whole trip. And so, I mean, you know, you hear... A widow, you know, like that, and then the. So you called me. We, was, I was I was just in two reporters with you at least. Yeah. And a former NSA guy who investigates these things, and you said, uh, "Let's wait two weeks." So we wait two weeks, and I didn't even know she was going to be on. I texted you at about nine at night. I was putting my kids to bed. Yeah. I texted you, go, "Hey, you know, how are you and her doing? You heard anything new?" And you go, "What are you talking about? She's on TV right now." Yeah. <laughs> so so let's fast forward. Where are you right then when I'm texting you? I was actually having dinner with a buddy, a buddy of mine, Spencer, and, uh, you know, we were just actually kind of going over some stuff I was talking about. He was asking me, you know, what, what are some new leads in the story? You know, have I made any progress? And next thing you know, he kind of nudges me and he's like, you're not going to like this, but look up. And I looked up at the TV and, you know, it's Elise Jordan, you know, Piers Morgan. And I just kind of got this sour gut feeling. I was like, oh, what, really? And then the interview goes on, and then she just seems happy. She's saying this is an accident, and I, my stomach hurt. I mean, I pretty much paid the bill, got up, and left. I just couldn't even stomach to be there, and not even until the next morning that I actually, after sleeping on it, did I even watch the, the video on YouTube. It was definitely a, a 180 change from how she was to this whole other. Well, I think clearly she was threatened. I mean, I, I, that's the that's the prime approximation. Or like you said, you know, maybe she wants them to think she's not investigating or something. But undoubtedly, a major reporter goes into hiding and is dead 24 hours later in a suspicious death with a car blowing up. I mean, this is... And now the police tapes have been released with witnesses saying, oh, it's driving down the road, it blows up, and then goes off the road into a tree. That's what all the other witnesses said. Yeah. So it just keeps piling on. I want this to be a regular crash. I don't like knowing they could come do this to me at any moment. I mean, it's not like I want this to be a government murder. What are your sources saying he was working on? Well, as we all know, was, well, like I said from the get-go, it was the CIA. More of, Now that's coming out, yeah. Yeah, so people are starting to you know, come out and say that. The other things as well were uh, he was in direct contact with Barrett Brown, who was arrested in, what was that, 2011 in Dallas? 2012, somewhere right there. Because I know he's been in jail for about a year now. Uh, Michael was talking to him. That was the CIA guy. He was the guy that was working on Project PM who was uh, doing a lot of computer hacking into the government that they were looking, they were doing mass spying on yeah. Americans. And he kind of uncovered a lot of that and then they raided, the FBI raided his house and put him in jail. So but he was also talking to a former CIA guy who was in North Africa who they put in prison. He was talking to a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he had a lot of things going on, but that Barrett Brown thing was a definitely key thing because... He even got a copy of the warrant that had all the arresting people involved on there. So, I mean, that, that in itself, the McChrystal thing, this, looking into the CIA, all these things add up to, you know, there's a lot of people pissed off at him. 
Well, uh, they killed uh, Aaron Schwartz, too, undoubtedly, who was really giving him trouble. We're going to come back from break, and I want to talk about uh, why he changed. Because you talked about this yesterday. You know, usually he was a lot nicer on TV. He wasn't as, and the weeks before, he's like, we got to get them. The government's evil. We got to get together. They're bad. They're coming after us. And he was like, I'm going to break something big. I mean, what was it? Think about this. What was it he'd learned that wasn't just, oh, they're spying on us or something? What had freaked him out? I think it was 9-11. I, I mean, my gut tells me he, he broke into the big stuff. And because uh, that's the big, I mean, I interviewed Barry Jennings, who was the deputy head of New York Emergency Management, on this show. And he said, no, they blew up Building 7. They had bombs in there. They told me he was dead two weeks later. I mean, just dropped dead. And the family moved out a week later. It was like some witness protection deal. In fact, some say that he probably staged his death and put him under national security. We'll be right. I mean, I interview a lot of people end up dead. I had tried everything. I'd cut back the amount of food I was eating. I was lifting weights and jogging, but nothing was working. My body was literally starving for minerals and trace elements as well as key vitamins. And as soon as I had that, I immediately could eat half of what I was eating previously and be satisfied. Now, there are hundreds of great products at InfoWarsTeam.com, but I want to point out the three that have helped me lose 37 pounds in just two months. Products like Beyond Tangy Tangerine, Pollen Burst, and Rebound. When I started taking the Tangy Tangerine and other products every day, I lost more than 37 pounds in just two months. Now that's results. I want to challenge my listeners to go to InfoWarsTeam.com and to order just three of their products, and you will see the changes in the way you look, feel, and in your appetite almost immediately. Start your journey to health and wellness today. InfoWarsTeam.com. All right, folks, we're going a little bit in the next hour with Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs. And then in studio, we're going to have one of my favorite filmmakers, Dan Dix, who's down here working with us on Obama Deception. Two with one of his uh, other um, members of uh, Press for Truth. So I look forward to getting some updates from him just on trying to shoot B-roll around the country uh, and the type of harassment he got from the police and people and the supposedly free nation. So that's coming up. Uh, Joe Biggs here with us. Uh, a good friends with the now deceased, uh, really patriot for the First Amendment, uh, Michael Hastings. Um, talk about, I mean, repeat what you said yesterday uh, uh, in your own words about the change you saw in him in the weeks leading up to his death. And now you said you've gone back and reviewed the videos. I mean, there was real, real concern there. Yeah, you know, when, when this all happened, I was very suspicious of everything. So I kind of sat down and I was like, all right, I need to go over a checklist. I need to create how he was, what things are happening now, you know, what I know, and then try to start trying to put the pieces together, see if any of this leads up to anything at the time. You know, this is just, you know, the days after. So I got on YouTube and I was like, you know, I think I'm going to start looking at a lot of his recent or, you know, interviews from starting about a year back. And then I want to start seeing them up until I, I watched his last one that was on the Young Turks, I believe. And, uh, we got to do something. They're coming for us. Yeah, you know, like you know, the first interviews I'm watching, you know, he's, you know, he's very calm, and you know, you know, Obama's great. We're doing all this good stuff, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, you know, towards the end, it's like, you know, they're they're trying to keep us from, you know, saying what we want to say. They're they're going to come after us, you know, if we speak the truth, you know. And he just his whole persona just shifted, and he went from you know being this calm person to like you said, apparently finding something out in that time frame leading up to his death to where he just felt like, you know, the press was under attack and he needed to be a hard charger. He needed to, to you know, stand up and people needed to see that, you know, it, it's affecting everyone out there. That's a normal response to tyranny is to act like that. People go, oh, it's so strange. That's how you're supposed to act when your country's being overrun by crooks. What, do you, what does your gut tell you he was discovering? I mean, we know it was CIA, it was government hacking, it was, but I mean, is that enough to make him act like that? I mean, he, he was working on many stories, multiple stories, of, as we've said. I mean, any of that all together. I mean, the stuff with Project PM is a big thing for me because all that hacking stuff that Barrett Brown was involved in was, you know, bringing to light that the government was mass spying on, you know, reporters and all these people. So I think that probably is it, because he was like, they're persecuting the press, they're coming after us, we've got to stand up against them. Yeah. And, and so I think that probably was it from what he said on that last interview. 
I mean, that's all it could be. I mean, I'm, I mean, to have that kind of job, to have that, his name's out there. He's a big person, you know, as far as, you know, worldwide known, you know, so to be, to see that kind of stuff, to see that our government's going to try to, you know, hush, hush everyone, that definitely, you know, is going to upset you. And I mean, that's definitely what happened. We're going to go to break and come back and have five more minutes. It's, it's been great having you here in town. We'll finish up discussing that, but um, I'm not calling the Young Turks out because that's not what I do. I mean, I call, I'll call people out for what they say that's wrong, but they said they were such good buddies with him. They've gone with the official story. Like all these so-called liberals that were friends with this guy have just gone with the official story. The, the, I mean, that's some great friends to have there, let me well, tell you. Some of those guys that work there, though, even reached out to me, and they're the ones that helped me confirm that Mike had had the cops come there you know, that people had visited them and the time. Okay, well, then maybe I missed it. Have they done shows on that? No, no, no. I, they haven't said anything. They've just told me in emails, you know, that's what they have said back. That's even me. worse. Yeah. So they're out there in L.A., they know about all this, and then, they, and, and then they're not doing anything about it. See, that shows they're not just dumb liberals. They're scared. And, and if everybody gets scared of the tyrants, they're going to take over. Don't people get that, that only free people that have courage will be free? If, you, if you're scared of tyrants, they'll take over. Unbelievable. That just blew me away. Wow. We'll be right back with the final segment with Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really glad we got this man to town, uh, Sar Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs. The only person out of all these military people that knew Michael Hastings, the young Turks that confirmed to him that, oh no, his brother was there, they were checking out his car, the police had been to his house, feds, they just called him feds, uh, and then his car blows up and he dies, and I'm not trying to start a fight with the young Turks, it just is really lonely, and, and what's scary is all the cowardice. What's scary is that he was friends, reportedly, and hung out with those people. Listen, if somebody kills me, man, my friends better well come out and, and, and call for an investigation. Or, bare minimum. I mean, it's just so dishonorable that you, I, I should, I guess, debrief you better. I'm not a cop or an interrogator. That's why I don't know how to get all the info out of you. You're like, oh, no, I talked to the Young Turks, too. They, you know, they're people, they're producers. They know they're the ones that gave me this, this, and that. They're out there with the whole investigation team. And then they were telling you, oh, yeah, no, this is real fishy. Uh, comments on that or comments on other tidbits people have told you? Um, that was just the, the one thing that kind of helped me, like, get my investigation going in a certain direction. You know, when I heard that from them, it was, that was definitely some helpful, helpful things for me to get on the right track, I would say. And uh, like I said, I don't know what they put out to the public as far as what they think happened and... I'm not. Yeah, to be fair, I don't follow all of it, but I probably would have heard about it. I, I, I've seen them about him. They just go, it's too bad. What a great guy. He's gone. I mean, I, I watched their memorial thing. They did a nice memorial piece on him and a video of all the interviews they've had, and it was really good. And I mean, from the way that Michael kind of showed passion on that show, it seemed like he did feel safe there with him. I mean... Well, my issue is, is I could say, oh, look at those fools having no idea what world they live in. But if the producer's like, oh, yeah, we know about the feds and all this. While the feds are on the news going, we didn't visit him. But his email says that that's happening. It's just like it becomes complicit when when you know stuff's going on, you don't say anything. I was always curious as to why the FBI released a statement saying they weren't investigating him. And that happened before I even released the email. So how did they even know that? Well, like you said, when you were out at uh, in the Army stationed in... Uh, El Paso at what, Camp Biggs? That's funny, same yeah, name as you. Biggs Army Airfield. Yeah, yeah, that uh, they say it's the safest city in the country. Tell folks what they'd say. There's no crime here, but, but in the parking lot there was shootings. Yeah, I mean, here. The, you know, there was, you get there and you, you have your uh, incoming briefing of how El Paso is. And they tell you that, you know, exactly, it's one of the safest cities in the U.S. And don't believe all that stuff you see on the news. And then, you know, I'm out here in the streets of UTEP, University of Texas, El Paso, and... There's drive-bys that happen, and I mean, it's not an everyday occurrence, but I mean... You said heads on the ground, though. But I mean, they dig up hundreds of bodies. It's unbelievable. Yeah, there was always gang violence and stuff like that. You know, you'd hear about it in the news and or they would find bodies sometimes just off to the side of the road and, you know... But their slogan is safest city in the U.S. That's yeah. the only reason I knew that. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. I'm not trying to attack El Paso, but that's as close to hell as you can get. I mean, when I've driven through there and it's all those weird, like, it's like apocalyptic, all those crumbling mountains and antennas and military wreckage everywhere. 
I mean, it's weird, man. Well, it's definitely like being in Kuwait. I mean, you, I was scared a lot of times there. I mean, I told a lot of the guys when I came back from overseas, I was like, it's almost worse. I'd rather go back to Afghanistan. I kept begging. I was like, let me deploy. <laughs> I'd rather be in Afghanistan than be in El Paso another day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I felt safer in Afghanistan sometimes. Yeah, you were saying that the apartments you stayed in were just full of FBI, DEA, but you'd hear shootings in the parking lot. Yeah, the FBI had their little... Uh, uh, building right across the street from where my apartment was. And uh, then on base, they have something called Epic El Paso Intelligence Center. And that's DEA, FBI, and all that stuff that they have there. That's the safest city in America. Yep. <laughs> well, man, good job for the press. Good job for freedom. Good job to just give some defiance to this tyranny and say, hey, we don't buy all your lies. And we appreciate you standing up for the press and for Michael Hastings. Thank you, sir, for having me. You bet. And I'm glad his wife's all at ease now and just says everything's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I guess some people think it's all peachy now. I still don't think so, though. Well, I mean, come on. Our government doesn't ever kill members of the press. No, never. And the NSA doesn't spy on us without warrants. And El Paso is the safest city. And the government doesn't ship drugs in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, you're something else. Sergeant uh, Joe Biggs. Now you can watch the InfoWars nightly news streaming live as it happens for free. Check it out at InfoWars.com forward slash show.